history from great big books like this one, where we got to see the big picture of American history and what happened over a broad span of time in this country. But what we didn't have in books like this was the history of the actual local neighborhoods where we live. We didn't learn about the buildings that we pass on our way to school every day. We didn't learn about the businesses that have been there for a hundred years on the corner. Those are not things that are in books like this. So who keeps track of that? Does anyone keep track of that? Well, in our area, we are very fortunate to have three historical societies locally that are preserving the history of their specific communities. Today, we're going to talk to someone from the Green Hills Historical Society, someone from the Coleraine Township Historical Society, and while we didn't have a chance to talk to someone from the Forest Park Historical Society, I will make sure that we talk about resources to connect with them too. So if these are your communities, you can connect with the very people who are preserving that history and maybe even become one of them and join them. Woven into the history of our community are the many businesses that are part of our neighborhoods. Waycross Community Media would especially like to thank the Forest Park Chamber of Commerce for partnering with us and sponsoring this episode of Community Corner. One of the historical societies that I want to make sure I get to introduce you to is right here in our local area, the Coleraine Historical Society. We have Mary Burdett here. Mary is the corresponding secretary for the Coleraine Historical Society. I'm going to stop because you're seeing a lower third on your screen that says Coleraine with an E and you're thinking I spelled it wrong and I did not. Coleraine historically had that E. Correct. Okay. Name for Coleraine, Ireland. John Dunlap's home. Okay. And so, oh, so let's start with John Dunlap. Let's talk just a little bit about the history of Coleraine. And we're not going to be able to cover it all because it goes all the way back to the 1790s. Mm -hmm. um, and so you said John Dunlap. If you've been in the Coleraine Township administrative, administrative building, you see there's a small mock-up mock -up of Dunlap Station. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so tell us a little bit about how that starts in the 17th, because Coleraine just had its 225th anniversary. Yes, So I we feel partied. like we should, yes, which one should do when one talks about history. Um, so let's talk about the 1790s in this area. John Dunlap was serving for uh, John Cleve Sims, and uh, when he came into the Coleraine area, he loved it. He thought he was home. And so he was very partial to this area. Um, and when he surveyed, then when he came back to Coleraine area. And so he called it Coleraine with the E. Somewhere along the line, a few maps in, it got lost, the E. Okay. But we honor him and his Coleraine homeland. And Coleraine, Ireland still exists. It's a big city. So... Uh, we honor that by uh, keeping the E in our historical society name. Okay. I, and I, I mean, that's why I mention it, because mm -hmm. um, if you're not from the area, then you, you're not sure which one is right. And if you're from the area, we don't spell Coleraine with an E anymore. Not anymore. Um, so the history of Coleraine, as a, first there's an, there's an attack on Dunlap Station. Dunlap Station was not a real fort. It was a fortified group of houses. Um, the um, Indians attacked, and they couldn't really break in, but the people who designed and built the houses had the roof sloping to the outside down, so dogs could jump up. So any moment an Indian might be able to get close enough to jump up to get in, but they did not. And uh, so they, uh, it was a very savage attack. It was very sustained for uh, uh, many hours. 
and uh, they did catch a surveying group outside and so that's where Abner Hunt becomes a prominent person. He was uh, tortured and eventually killed and um, so I think it kind of helped the people inside with the soldiers and the settlers and they um, withstood and uh, somebody did go for help and I think help was coming from Port Washington but uh, they did withstand and the Indians left. So. And I want to, um, 1791, Cincinnati is still not a safe place. It's oh, no. It's still a wilderness, which is why to live there, even if it's not a fort, it had to be fortified. Correct. Then in 1794, it becomes a township. We become a township. That's fantastic. And we are the largest natural township in the state. Um, John Dunlap, again, was a surveyor. He surveyed um, his own way. And I tell people, well, he had the river to deal with over on this side. So that kind of meant he, so uh, we did end up a largest township now in, in places in the state. Places were annexed into townships, but we are still the largest natural, I say now, okay. township. How long have you been part of the Coleraine Historical Society? I joined in the year 2000, and it wasn't too many years before I started doing different jobs, and I've done pretty many of them uh, in, within the society. So. And uh, I think you told me before we started, 55 years ago is when the Historical Society was formed in Coleraine. Yes. Ruth Wells was our founder, and she uh, was involved in the uh, College Hill Historical Society, and there was nothing for Corrin Township, so she said, okay, let's do it, and she did. And uh, over the years, a lot of things have happened, and many people have uh, worked hard, and uh, so we sit today with a small museum. We sit with uh, projects in the community that you can see, we're the caretaker of the watering trough on Coleraine Hill uh, from uh, Giles Richards. And we are um, the keeper of the toll house at uh, the Heritage Memorial Park on East Miami River Road. It has been saved and it was then moved to the park and completely redone. And uh, there is a ton of history inside, uh, boards up on the walls that tell about the history of the building itself and people and township. So it's really a great thing. It's open when the park is open. If you wonder why in the world did they call that North Gate Mall, at Coleraine and Springdale was the North Gate that you paid toll to go to town. And all the farmers from the township, plus out into Butler County, Indiana, all drove their animals to the city, to the stockyards, or to be processed, or any other kind of produce, they paid toll at the North Gate. Oh, and I did not know that. So it is the North Gate Mall. Okay, so this is why we need to talk to our local historical societies, because this is the local history that we do touch, drive by. Yes. We don't know why that's even on the sign. Um, and but every time we go by that it's a reminder that this is part of history i love parts of the history that are preserved that you can go and concretely touch and so you talked about um the watering trough the watering trough is one half of the roller so it's flat here on the top but round on the bottom uh, that giles richards and others of course used to pave colrain avenue hill and so he uh, said, well, let's save this. There was a spring there. And so what the happens is the water comes down and sits in the watering trough and then overflows when need be or whatever. But it's a piece of the real history of Colrain Township when Colrain Hill, which was the major roadway, those farmers can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then also when they have driven their animals or their wagon or whatever they're taking, they could always stop at the watering trough and get a drink. Now, whether the guys drank, I don't know, but the animals could certainly drink. And that was part way up Coleraine Hill. So it, it served a great purpose besides the reminding. And um, so piece of our history literally is right there. 
and there's a toll house that's part of that history. The toll house is now located in Heritage Memorial Park on East Miami River Road, and it literally was a toll house. It had the gate that went across and stopped the people so they could collect their two cents for whatever and 12 cents for a buggy and a, wag, a horse and whatever the fees were of the day, then that's how they collected them. And it was saved uh, for about 10 years or more, 13 years, I think. And then it was brought out again, carried down to um, Heritage Memorial Park and completely redone. We've had a wonderful business support. Uh, the concrete was donated. The um, actual putting, picking it up and putting it on a truck and bringing it down and picking it up and putting it on the slab. All of it was donated, um, so we are very grateful for our business community to help us. And inside is a, a just a board after board with the history of the actual building and how it served the community. And it served over on the Banning and Chevy area, Banning Road and Chevy Road area. Uh, so it's wonderful that we were able to uh, have history right in front of people and they can um, touch it and talk about it. And so we also have plans for that area for a tree uh, outlined uh, shape of uh, Dunlap Station. So it'll be a it'll be a few years and a few trees away, okay. but we have plans for that. We are only briefly hitting yes. stories because we don't have time to to do all of the details. Um, but honestly, it's the details and the stories that make history interesting. I yes. think. Um, so I'm going to mention because you have with you, you there is a book that you have put together, and then it has mm -hmm. been revised. Uh, you as a historical study. Um, Coleraine Township Revisited. Um, this one belongs to the Historical Society, but you have these for sale. Yes. Okay, so they, if they um, contact you through, we're going to talk about the website and all that in a minute, um, If they, they, there's a way to find out how to get this. This is written by Ruth Wells, it says. A and okay. others, uh-huh. And others, okay. Yes. We do also have two books. Okay. We have one of the photo books uh, put together. We do have those oh, for yeah. sale. And um, then we also have an official um, history of Coleraine Township, um, and that's available, and um, you can connect with us to uh, find out how to order that one. That's uh, Joe Flickinger wrote that book, okay. and he has also written Green Township History. So just in case, you might be interested in Green. Right next door, okay. Right next door, indeed. Northgate Mall also has a second story. Um, it used to be the Mount Healthy Airport, and it was the Mount Healthy Airport because the airport had to have a post, had to have a name that included a post office. There was no, by that time, there was no post offices officially in Corin Township. So they okay. called it the Mount Healthy Airport. And it was, a, it had an interesting, pretty long life as an airport. We also are the proud owner of two other airports. The really? Clifford Airport for Clifford uh, business that's still in Grossbeck. Okay. They had their own airport, which is now Clifford Park. Okay. Uh, it got uh, moved around and changed because of the 275 went through. So it's now Clifford Park. And we also had a Lakewood Airport, which was really only a few more miles away over on uh, by Pippin Road. So we had three airports at the same time in our tiny Oh, just in this corner township. of the county, though. Just, just in, in this little corner of the county, we had three different airports. So I thought I thought that was pretty good. There's another project that you're working on, and it has to do with working with the township on uh, preserving the cemeteries, because that's a big part of the history of any area. The local history is the information that's on the stones in the cemetery. Yes. Yes. So what are you doing with the township to, with that project? Well, right now it's in the survey stage and what uh, we have different volunteers go to the different cemeteries. And you might think, oh, Dunlap Cemetery, okay, that's down there by Heritage Park. Well, that's not, that's pretty much the first cemetery or the most historical, but we all have many more than that that the township takes care of. And so they are starting a process where they will be uh, looking at repairing the stones and making the um, cemeteries 
uh, more presentable. Time does what time does to um, stones and property. So the township has committed over the next several years to um, working with the Historical Society and, and making these more presentable uh, in honor of the people who are buried there and in recognition of the people of today that we do honor and recognize the, our four um, fathers who came and uh, lived and died here. So if people are trying to contact the Coleraine Historical Society, what are the ways they can do that? They can go on the website, they can go on Facebook, um, they can uh, connect with somebody who knows one of us and all you have to do is then make an appointment and we'll be there and help as much as we possibly can. I want to thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. When we talk about the history of Cincinnati, in some of the towns we can go to recorded history back to 1788 and beyond and before that, but when we're talking about the history of Green Hills, it's a little bit more recent than that. So. We have with us Paul Richardson, past president of the Green Hills Historical Society. And Paul, you are here to tell us a little bit about the local history of Green Hills. First of all, thank you for having me. And I'm kind of a, uh, when you mentioned Green Hills to me, I could probably talk for hours. Uh, it, it's a really unique community and there's only three of them in the country. And they were developed uh, during the Great Depression. FDR basically wanted to put people back to work. WPA was heavily involved, so uh, they actually built three towns, and they were they were kind of socialistic. These are planned communities, the 1930s, um, and uh, when you you say they're socialistic, they, they wanted to make sure they had every element that someone in that neighborhood needed right in that little community, right? It was a self it was a self-contained neighborhood, and it was built. Uh, Green Hills was what well, most of them were built what we call out in the boonies. There really wasn't anything around the closest uh, to, to Green Hills was Glendale and Mount Healthy. So it was really in the middle of nowhere. And it was kind of unique because uh, the government basically went in and bought, uh, I forget, 2,500 acres of ground in a matter of a month to get this project going. FDR really wanted to put people to work. That was the main goal. Sometimes I think about the planned development of Green Hills in terms of soldiers returning after World War II and house, housing for them, but this is before that. This was the housing that was needed, like you said, how can we get people out into suburban areas and uh, this is a time when Green Hills wasn't completely surrounded by all kinds of developments yet. It was still out in the middle of nowhere. So it's, it's exciting to think about the new. So what were some of the things that were there at the very beginning? They had, it was, it was a community and a lot of people said they lived in, and it was a utopia. They had, I mean, they had a shopping center, they had a swimming pool, they had a, the farmers would bring in their produce and their, and their beef, they actually had a foot locker. I mean, everybody keeps saying about how, how everything was there for the residents. And even the farmers would come into the town, and if you needed a dozen eggs, they'd basically uh, come into your house and Put a dozen eggs on your on your table, and, and it was it was a very friendly and uh, a great place to raise a family. One of the neat things I think is 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 you have to remember again it was in the middle of nowhere, but if you're familiar uh, with the with the big white building, which was the, yeah. the Green Hills Community Building, that was basically there for an, for the first class of 1938. Before then, there was a one room schoolhouse called Science Hall School down in Winton Woods. Unfortunately, it was torn down. But you have to remember this is 1938. These are people that are really used to being in a rural life and uh, you know the first graduating class from Green Hills were from that building and I'll add another thing that's interesting about that building which a lot of people don't know it was designed by Roland Wank who was also on the group of architects which earlier on designed Union Terminal so there's a lot of history that's interwoven in Green Hills of really uh, uh, outstanding people what are some of the other favorite stories, those little tidbits that over your time of researching all this information? One of my favorites, which relates to, which relates to the community building, was the fact that, and I, I think it was 1958, uh, then Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali, uh, they actually had fights in the, in the gymnasium, in the community building. Can you imagine Muhammad Ali 
you know, in the Green Hills Community Building. It was just, it was just awesome. I have a picture of the building being built in 1936, and it was built of bright red brick. And a lot of people say, well, why did they paint this building white? I think there was two reasons for it. One is, of course, it was the international style of architecture, which was kind of unique for its time. And I think they did it for two reasons. Well, the other reason was because uh, the men needed work. And what, you get this big three inch paintbrush with white paint, and you don't give it just one coat of paint, you give it two coats of white paint. So that's why the building was white for the international style. And the other reason, one of the sub reasons was a lot of people don't realize that white was a very reflective color. So they were, they were into the environment back then, thinking about what, what, the, uh, what the environment was like. But one of the interesting things was another person, which wasn't local, but Rexford Tugwell, who he was part of, uh, he was part of FDR's brain trust, and he was put in charge of the project. And uh, it was interesting because a lot, he later, uh, I think he became the governor of Puerto Rico, but he was referred to as Rexford Red Tugwell. And a lot of people said this whole idea, the whole idea of this, so, oh, the government's getting involved in housing, socialism, and, and they called him Rexford Red because a lot of people said he was communistic. So you get these different little weaving things going on in the community yeah. about different people. So, I mean, it was, it was really ahead of its time. And only three communities got built, and there were going to be 25 eventually. And the fourth one, which was in, in New Jersey, that basically uh, people got up in arms and the government didn't finish it then. It's interesting to note, and I, these are little side stories and I, you know, we, that we have our history. We have all the newspapers in our archives division from the original 1938 newspapers. And I was reading one the other day and somebody said, wow, back in the day, there were only two, not stoplights, two stop streets from Spring Grove Avenue to Green Hills. The second one was Compton Road. So this is a two lane road going up from, from Spring Grove Avenue to Green Hills. Can you imagine two stop signs? You have newspaper archives. What other kind of treasures have you collected at the Historical Society? We have been very fortunate, thanks to the Wenton Woods School District, and I'll mention Mr. Steve Denny here. We have been very fortunate. Uh, a few years ago, we were basically in what was our archive room upstairs on the second floor. And so it's a decent sized room, but we outgrew that room. So we were lucky enough to be given or, or basically leased for 100 years by the school district uh, for a dollar, uh, the, the room which a lot of people will remember, which was the old library and has a beautiful frieze in that building that goes all the way around the room by Richard Zollner. And it's basically the history of Cincinnati from Lusannisville to barges on the river. And it's a beautiful freeze and it's in excellent condition, but we, we really probably quadrupled our space and we're starting to run out, uh, run out of that space now. What kinds of things are you saving? Anything and everything from the 30s, from utensils to, to uh, toasters. We actually have a reproduction, or we, we saved a lot of the old, there were metal cabinets uh, for kitchen cabinets, and we actually reproduced a kitchen which brings me to another interesting story. Okay. Uh, and I said the government supplied everything. Well, they actually had wooden uh, uh, butcher block countertops. And, and they basically pulled them out every spring, refinished them, put them back in, the, in, in each, each apartment. And what's interesting, on the bottom of the butcher block is the address of the particular apartment. And another one, God, I could go on forever, but another one is there were multiple playgrounds throughout there. So the children basically walked to all the playgrounds. They were called pocket parks. I think okay. there were five or six originally. And the government, basically in the wintertime, took down every last piece of playground equipment, put it in storage, repainted it, and put it back up in the springtime. The pool was original. And here we are in 19, you know, it was, it was ready for the people in 1938. And here you are in Green Hills, in the middle of nowhere. Hey, Glendale didn't have a swimming pool. I'm not sure if Mount Healthy had an outdoor swimming pool, but you know, Green Hills supplied you with, and it was really to keep you busy. You know, everything was, uh, you know, there was, I think, I forget what the membership was, but it was to keep you busy. And of course, a lot of the young kids would spend days and days in and out in what, what is now Wenton Woods. You'd go out in the daytime and you'd play out in the woods all day and then 
You'd hear you'd hear a call from mom and dad, time to come in for supper. I've got another story about that because Green Hills was one of the first electrified communities in the country. It was also one of the first towns to have all underground utilities. Oh, nice. But you, when the lights came on at night, here again we have electri electric street lights. When the lights came on at night, you knew it was time to come in. And the side story to that is people would come up the hill, which there, you know, there, there's no Finney Town, whatever. They'd come up the hill, and the story goes that people thought Martians had landed in Green Hills from all the lights. So another little funny story about the town. A lot of people don't know this. Frances Perkins, uh, who was appointed by FDR, she was the first woman who was the uh, Secretary of Labor. And she, she did a lot of things as far as I think she, she created a lot of in interesting things about uh, people having equal you know, rights to work for 40 hours a week. She was very involved in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, she was part of the National Industrial Recovery Act. So she was FDR's first woman appointee, and she lasted uh, until 1945. She was, she was the longest serving position of the first woman appointed to the U.S. cabinet. I have another important person, which is kind of interesting. This is a local person. Uh, he was basically a maintenance person at Green Hills, at the old Green Hills community building. Clarence Page was his name, and Clarence was a young African American, and he had a band, and he played a, at a lot of the functions uh, in Green Hills. Lots of neat little stories about not only international and, and nationally famous people, but local people too. So when can, if people are listening to this, and we're not going to be able to do all the great stories of Green Hills, <laughs> um, although I want to, and that might be a future project, uh, what, how can folks get involved and come over and see what you have and learn these stories? Well, we have an archive division, and that is run by... A literally neat lady, Jackie Seymour, and you would have to make an appointment. The really the greatest place to go is to our Facebook page, and we have hundreds of pictures of Green Hills on our Facebook page. Here's another local one, which a lot of people don't really realize. Um, I'll kind of read off of this. Rosemary Clooney, everybody knows yeah. the Cloonies, and she basically uh, lived with her aunt and uncle in Green Hills in the summertime. And of course, we had two or three bands. Uh, in the summer, you know, that played in Green Hills for for different things, but I always like to read this. If I, if you don't mind, I'll read it. And this was basically uh, from. Unfortunately, Tom Haverlin has passed away, but I'll read it. Rosemary and her sister Betty sang in Bill Petering's dance band uh, before WLW days. Don Landers and I used to pick up the Clooney sisters from their uncle's home in Green Hills to sing at Petering's dance dates at the community building. They always sat in the back seat of Don's dad's Plymouth four door of Don's with Don's drums. Neither Don or I ever made it to the back seat. Thomas Haverlin, class of nineteen forty six. That's a really entertaining reminiscence. <laughs> I want to thank you. And thank so you much. for having me. And like I said, you go to that you go to our Facebook page, you'll find a, a you'll you'll actually get hooked. I mean you can get hooked on on what really went on in the 30s in Cincinnati, and we're very fortunate to be one of the three uh, Greenbelt towns. Thank you for watching this episode of Community Corner on Waycross Community Media. Waycross has a long history of its own, being part of the local communities in Forest Park, Green Hills, Springfield Township, and Coleraine Township. I'm Dana Gagnon, Government Programming Coordinator at Waycross, and I look forward to seeing you on our next program. Mm -hmm.